Hello, welcome to the final of Dreadnoughts from Around the World, 1905 to 1914. Now, why have I included this? Why have I got 1915 in here? When it says it's only going up to 1914. Well, because honestly, you can't cover 1914 properly without also getting into 1915. And, well, for starters, I also wanted to talk about the Leon class because I wanted to talk about the French battleship design, which is actually also pretty darn good. And so here we go. Now, hmm. I'm hoping the slides are okay, but oh, um, they appear to have not saved the proper ones. Ah, well, they. So the renowned class battle cruiser. As you can see, pretty decent. Oh, I'm just going to redo these slides. Now that's better. Sorry. So, six BL 15 inch Mark 1 guns in three twin turrets. So that's four forward and two aft. But what's really interesting about them is they have 17 BL 4 inch guns, Mark 9 guns, in five treble turrets and two single. So, kind of interesting idea, you know, they have the treble 4 inch guns. And. It's one of those routes not go, gone down, because you think about it, what would happen if the trebles had actually been continued on into World War Two? if the treble mounts had been the standard for the secondary armament? It's, it's a really cool part of the thing. And again, this is one of the reasons why I do think there is some credence to the idea of the Agincourt being an 18-inch ship, because again... There are treble turrets and treble mounts talked about for it. So I think it was going to get some sort of heavier armament. Because you would have had a heavy secondary armament. <sighs> 112,000 shaft horsepower. <sighs> 32 knot top speed. Honestly, when these things enter the water, there is nothing, really, that could be done to avoid them, to run away from them. Conversely, these ones don't really fit that same pattern. So, that's why they have a question mark after them. Battle cruiser. Really? They have the treble 4-inch mount today. And in fact, they have six of them. 24 treble mounts. It, it's one of the things in that for these ships, etc., so many resources suddenly appear. And Jackie Fisher does have a habit of cancelling ships. You would expect him to support a Super Queen if there was one building, so that's why that adds credence to the idea that she was just a regular Queen Elizabeth class. But so many resources suddenly appear that get channeled into his other projects 18 inch guns appear. They've already been ordered. So if you don't suddenly order You've had to have been developing it, and why would you have been developing it? For a, a, a large light cruiser, which you didn't even know was going to exist in a few years' time? Probably not. Treble 4-inch guns? Again, they appear. Yes, there have been... Uh, Toying around, but there's suddenly a lot of mounts going around. Think about it. There is five on each of the renowned class. That's ten mounts. Then there is six on both courageous and glorious. That's twenty-two mounts going around. That's not something you are quickly churning. Uh, you are quickly developing and churning out if you are putting them on these pre uh, prestigious ships. Top speed of thirty-two knots. 90,000 shaft horsepower, 18 small tube boilers. Mm -hmm. Small tube boilers coming in. That's pretty darn useful. Again, 
they were, there are small tube boilers suddenly appearing in a large number. Again, boilers are not something you can rapidly build. Even in wartime, you have other needs. You have destroyers. You have all sorts of things you're building boilers for. Small tube boilers are the size you put in a capital ship or a large cruiser. Hmm. So, technically, it's got 15-inch guns. So, technically, possibly it is a battle cruiser, but... Large light cruisers fits uh, fits better. Honestly, build two more of these. That would have been nicer. I would prefer four of these any day of the week to the two of those existing because as battle cruisers, they get turned into carriers. That's cute and that, that's useful, but you know. Again, if you're going to be building battle cruisers, build a battle cruiser. You have just built what is arguably the best battle cruiser built to that date. And then you go and build this. And you sort of go, yeah, we're stripping out another turret off it. And we're giving it some more four inch guns as a compensation. Or they could have gone for two treble 15 inch turrets. That would have been cool. Imagine that with three treble 15 inch turrets. <sighs> Sorry. Anyway, let's go. Good God. Excuse the French. Um, well, and it was excuse the French at this point. They have produced a, de a good design. Okay, they're still sticking with the 13.4 inch guns. When everyone else by now at this point has gone on to 15 inch guns, even the courageous class. But. They're also a mixture of steam turbine, turbines and triple expansions engines, or an all-turbine system. But they would have looked good, and they would have been interesting. Seriously, the, the last but gasp of French dreadnoughts was certainly were the best ones. And the most viable. But they weren't built. None of them were finished. We can all imagine what World War II would have looked like if these had actually been in service in the French Navy. Upgraded vessels. Hopefully by that time the French would have upgraded I don't know, to treble 16 inches. Those turret rings could have taken a treble 16 inch. Let's be honest, they're fat turret rings. They really are. Um, just going back because I, I thought about it afterwards I, I, I did finger these letters as I've said before there is only context and there is only the outline of the jigsaw we have no idea really Argincourt could have been and most likely there is a 70-30% chance on documents I couldn't read, that she was just another Queen Elizabeth class. But on the uh, on same documents, there is the option that she was improved in some ways, and there is a lot of equipment, long ter long lead items, which get appear at time she's cancelled, which get put into things like the courageous class. To an extent, into the renowns as well, and later into Furious. There are. How do I put this? Having spent enough time around the archives, looking at the work of Jackie Fisher, looking at the work of other naval officers at this period, and looking at what happens with the Royal Navy in the run up to World War Two and during World War Two and during World War One. There is enough that I am suspicious, but I cannot prove it anyway. And I'm so it's not 
I am always careful, uh, careful because people start to say conspiracy theorists or anything like that. It's not that. But historians, and every historian will tell you, there is usually not so much a what if as a... possibility, probability. And sometimes those things turn out to be correct, sometimes they turn out to be wrong. The possibility probability on this one is, the probability is it she's another Queen Elizabeth class. That's the probability. But because of the context going on around her and the sheer minimality of the information that's around her, and the way she is, her construction is organized and is quite quiet and isn't being as discussed or as visible as others are, does lead to you to be able to sort of go, hang on, what's going on? This has meant there are plenty of phantom stories around her which you then have to pick through. But the phantom stories often have a kernel of evidence. It's often someone has found a sliver of evidence and then they've run with it. And the question is to go through those stories and find out what the sliver of real evidence is and then put it with the other sliver of real evidence and try and figure it out. And my theory is that the British already have a gun program heading towards 18 inches. I'm, I'm Because I said, 16 and a half inch, if the Americans make their jump and the Japanese make their jump to the 16 inches. 16 and a half inch is not enough advantage for the British to jump to. So 18 inches got them. So there's got to be an 18 inch gun program in the works. And lo and behold, Furious appears. 18 inch guns do appear. That makes sense. The British in World War II and World War I have a crash building of the ships which they think they can get finished in time and the ships which are more complicated, the ones which they are pushing the technological envelope, get paused. Agincourt is the last Queen Elizabeth class. She should be one which you can finish off quite easily and quickly because you have built so many this should be just continuing on the iterations. But she's paused and stopped. Now, you can point to crewing difficulties and all these things. I, I agree, but you can just shut down some pre-dreads and replace them, because let's be honest, she's more useful than some of the pre-dreads. Pre Which gives me the idea that perhaps she wasn't the same as her sisters. She was advanced in some way. And then it becomes a question of how far do you push it. Small tube boilers? Well, that wouldn't seem to be enough of a change for you to st pause her construction because small tube boilers ha are around. And it would be quite useful. We've got a battleship which is, in every other way, is a Queen Elizabeth class, but she can now do 28, 29 knots. Whoa, well, hey. But next generation guns combined with next generation boilers, and that is complexity. Because guns are complicated, the turrets are complicated, the rings, everything has to be adjusted, the hull will probably have to be slightly longer and slightly different. So that's my thinking. But as I said, I cannot prove it. The Americans are building the New Mexico class. 12, 14 inch. Oh. And I like the Americans. They're churning out the standards here, but you can tell they're looking into more stuff. And I, I, I like the cheekiness of the response. Yeah, you've built 15 inch gun ships. Yeah, you've only got 8 though. We've got 12, 14 inch. Are you really confident enough that us with 50% more guns are inferior to you? And the Japanese are building the SA class. Again, 12, 14 inch guns. But in six twin turrets. Now, there are various reasons around this, but I think it's an early symptom myself of the Japanese thinking they're going to fight outnumbered and wanting to be able to have turrets on multiple targets, i.e., forward turrets engage. 
one target. Half turrets engage another target. Center turrets engage one a target, then the other target. I think that makes sense. I think this is an early thing of the Japanese thinking they're going to be out fighting outnumbered. But they're not going to be outgunned because they're going to have the same guns. Again, the Japanese are more sensible than the Germans are on this front. So how many dreadnoughts are there in the world in 1915? Well... You can take out Turkey, you can take out, well, Chile. Um, they've all gone to British. Australia's now backing up the Royal Navy. But she's HMS Australia, yeah, but she's backing up the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy has zoomed ahead and they have far more in construction. And, sorry, that graph is wrong. Give me a second. Now that's a better graph. That's the graph I actually wrote. Hello. Oh, hello. So, now, when you're saving PowerPoints to JPEG, sometimes it seems to go weird. I'm not sure why it doesn't like the inbuilt Excel. As you can see, yes, the Germans have managed to build a fleet, and the, some of the earlier graphs will be wrong as well. I do apologize. But, let's look at that fleet. The Royal Navy have 39 dreadnoughts in service. And they have 12 under construction. The Germans have 22 in service. And... Nine under construction, of which, really, only one will get finished in the war. That's industrial capacity. That's focus. Now, this all goes back to, really, the origins of the Dreadnought, and the base of the Dreadnought. Why does Britain build a Dreadnought in the first place? What is the advantage for them in building a ship which wipes out immediately their overwhelming superiority in pre-dreadnoughts. I said before, it's because of the technology race going. They don't need pre-dreadnoughts to take on the German. Uh, they don't need dreadnoughts to counter the Germans. Yes, Jackie Fisher will make the claims about them being more cost-effective, da 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 this. But in the end, they come down to, they're not to counter the Germans. The Germans are happily building pre-dreadnoughts. And they're not all necessarily all they're cracked up to be. But the Americans, the Italians, and eventually the Japanese all look like they're going down the old big gun route. And British can't afford them to steal the march on them. And they can't do it. And this leads us to where they were going. There is a plan for the South Dakotas in the 1920s that would have had 12 16-inch guns. Oh, glorious. And there is an M3, which is conceivably not that too different to the plan of the British for the 18-inch gunned battle, British battleship in the 1920s. There are some historians who write of an Anglo-American naval race post-World War I, 
which they solve with a treaty. They miss one of the key points about the Anglo-American naval race. It was always more about technology than numbers. And it's been going on for a long time. And arguably the Dreadnought itself, the entire race itself, is about this technological race going on. And who's going to be the biggest and the best builder? Why? Because it matters for export markets. If you want to build your naval infrastructure, you need to export. You need to get other people to pay for it. If you want to sell ships, that means you need to be building the best ships. So that's why Britain builds Dreadnought. Well, it's one of many reasons why. There are not... Rarely in history is there a single reason for doing something. Rarely ever in life is there a single reason for doing something. And if someone turns around and tells you there is only one good reason to do something, it's probably not something you should be doing. Naval history, the, Ang uh, the uh, naval races of the 1900s are all far more complicated than just ships. And I haven't really noticed the graphs all the way through, so I hope the graphs were right. Possibly at points they were wrong. I'm sorry if they were. I will make sure they're all right if we do if people want to do the live and make sure to go through them all. The thing is though why are the Americans building bigger ships? Is that to compete with the British? No, that's to compete with the Japanese. Why are the Japanese building bigger ships? To compete with the Americans. Why do the British have to build bigger, sh bigger guns than both? Because they want to export. The, uh, they want to export battleships. Do people like the Brazilians, the Chileans, the Argentines, the Greeks, the Ottomans, everyone else who they can sell them to? Why do nations invest in very advanced satellite communication systems and etc. domestically built satellites even if they don't have a domestic launch facility? Because it gets them into the satellite market, which is uh, which makes money. In the early 1900s, even to this day, arms are money. How would the Americans have responded to an 18-inch British battleship? Well, for starters, they'd have started laughing. Sorry about that. Because the British battleship... Yes, they've done as much as they can to give it as wide a field of fire aft as possible, but it's got the same problem as the battle class destroyers and... Lots of other ships which are a lot smaller, and some ships which are bigger. To fire aft, it's going to need to zigzag quite dramatically. It's a broadside firing fighting ship for a broadside engagement. I would argue that's more suitable for World War Two and the coming conflict. And that is something which probably would have been fine for Jutland, where they're all forming up in divisions and squad uh, uh, divisions and the squadron uh, and uh, battle squadrons and everything's nicely organised and there's lots of ships. Then that's that's fine, but it isn't fine for the task force world, which has been emerging in World War One, which beyond the North Sea was how the fights were raging. It isn't, doesn't fit with the doctrine which Jellicoe and many other officers were pushing for into the Royal Navy post-World War I. It fits with the dreams of Churchill, perhaps, because he does seem obsessed with Nelson and Rodney as these bastions, when actually you don't want them on the end of your fleet. 
Um, they're slow and they are they're a gun to roll forward. Are you licking my glass? You are. Okay, right, I'm not going to be drinking from that. I just decided it needs to be washed. These would have been just the same. The South Dakotas. Now, they are flexible assets. They really are. All round gunfire. So, what have we got coming up? We have. 3rd of June. Suggestions from Adfab, Coastal Command in the 1920s and 1930s. And 1st of June, we have Monitors of the Royal Navy, Section 5. I'd better make sure that's recorded before I go away. Mm hmm. And take care. And you don't notice, but I'm recording this, and then I've got a live this evening on Star Wars Fleets, which is fun because it might have been affecting some of my discuss uh, discursive topics in this. But until then, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you, everyone, for liking videos, if you like them. Thank you to everyone who subscribed. It was nice. Thank you to everyone who's decided to join the Discord for a conversation. Link down below. There's also a link down below to the Patreon if you want to fund my research and vote in the Patreon's Choice or suggest topics for Patreon's Choice, which should have finished. Well, no, should be finishing today. So I'll be making the announcement, well, if I'm doing a live, if people wanted to today when this comes out take care thank you everyone and um have fun